Good morning and welcome to another online Awakened Sermon. This week, well, originally I, I had an interview with Heiko. It was all set, ready to go, ready to be sent out. But obviously, we've experienced quite a bit in the past week or so. And maybe you're like me, and you find yourself filled with all sorts of different emotions. There's sadness, immense grief over what we've witnessed, what we've experienced. There's some anger, anger that things like this still go on in our country. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of tiredness as well. And you're wondering what could possibly happen next. We're only in June, yet it, fe it feels like we've lived more than 12 months in just the first five months of this year. And I thought what I want to talk about this morning is I just want to address the blatant racism that we see in our country right now. It's something that needs to be addressed. It's something that needs to be talked about. And unfortunately, uh, while we would like to think that racism, racial inequality, is something in our distant past, it's very clear from these events over the past seven to ten days, and even longer, uh, is that racism is alive and well in our country. There are immense injustices that exist all around us, and we need to do something about it. We need to address it, we need to make changes, we need to talk about it, and we need to find a new way forward. We need to find a way to move forward together. So this week, maybe you've been like me, and I've been going on each morning these long walks around the neighborhood just trying to sort things out, trying to make sense of all that's going on and trying to figure out for me, well, how do I respond? How, how can I, uh, in a helpful way, help move things forward? H how can I be a person who brings healing to our communities? H how can I bring some, be someone who brings the much needed peace of Christ to this world, to this country, that we live in. So I, I would say first uh, is we need to acknowledge uh, the racism that exists. We need to acknowledge what's going on. And obviously there is a heightened level of awareness right now. Uh, there's a heightened level of all that's been happening and uh, we're seeing it on the news. Uh, we're talking about it, which is a really good thing. And that's where it starts. We need to acknowledge, hey, this exists in our country. Uh, this is real. This is ongoing. This hasn't gone away. We can't just sweep it under the rug any longer. We have to bring it out into the open. I was having a conversation last night with a group of people, and someone said that racism is something that has existed in the shadows for a long, long time. It's always been there. It's baked into who we are as a country. So I think the first step in beginning to remove it, uh, beginning to take it out of our country, remove it out of circulation, out of existence, the first step is we have to acknowledge, yes, it's there, it exists, and it is not right. That's the first step, and then we can begin taking the proper steps to eradicating it completely, which, let's be honest, it's going to be a journey. It's going to take some time. It's been here from the beginning, so it's going to take a lot of really, really difficult conversations. It's going to take a lot of active steps in order to make sure that we completely remove it from our American life together. Now, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. Uh, as many of you know, obviously, I'm a pastor. And so 
as I've been thinking through this and what is to be my individual response, but what's to be our collective response? What, what's to be our, uh, the response as an entire church? How do we address this and begin to make some of these changes? There is a verse in 2 Corinthians, which I feel like we've been, this is another letter bit written by the Apostle Paul, and I feel like we've been looking at uh, Paul's letters quite a bit recently over the past couple of weeks. But here's another verse that to me, I always hold this in front of me. I hold this one close to my heart. Uh, this is something that inspires me, that motivates me, that really uh, speaks to all that I do. Uh, it's found in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 18, Paul says, All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul is speaking to a church. He's speaking to a group of Christ followers, people who have pledged their allegiance to the path of Jesus. Instead of following the way of Caesar, which is all about labels, in a particular ranking system, instead of following that path, there's a group of people who have come to realize that way of living, it's harmful, it's destructive, it strips people of their humanity. Whenever there's a caste system and you have a, a ranking system of, well, there's some people that are here and others that are less than, these followers of Jesus are saying, that's not right. It's not helping us move forward. It's not embracing the humanity of others all of us. It's not actually uniting us together. And so when Jesus came and preached this message of unity, we're all God's children. We can all be a part of the family of God. There's no one who's greater than anyone else. There were a group of people who said, yes, that is where life is found. That is the way forward. And Paul, uh, one of the first followers of Jesus, he is now imploring others to walk this path, to trust their life to the path of Jesus. And he says in this verse, God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I would argue that at the heart of being a follower of Jesus, what does it mean to be a Christian? At the center of that is exactly what Paul tells the Corinthians to be ministers of reconciliation. Now, what is reconciliation? It's to bring together two things that have been separated. Um, it means to restore. It means to unite. So Paul tells the Corinthians, as God has reconciled himself to us, we are then to go out and to be ministers. Another way of saying this, servants. Of reconciliation. We're to be people who go out, who build bridges, who work to bring peace, healing to the world. We're seeing right now immense brokenness in our country. There is brokenness that has hurt so many people. It has taken lives there's a brokenness, a corruption that exists in our country. And right now, we need people, we need ministers of reconciliation to take active steps. See, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, in talking about this topic of racism, this is something you can't sit on the sidelines. You can't be passive in this. This is something that you must be active in. The commission that we've been given as followers of Jesus is to be servants of reconciliation. We are to go out and through our lives, through how we're living, the conversations, the actions we take, we are to be people who reflect the God of this universe, a God of love, a God of peace, a God of unity, a God who deeply, deeply respects each human. We are to be a reflection of that image to the world around us. And that shows up in how we live our lives. So when we come to the topic of racism, there's no sitting on the sidelines if you're a follower of Jesus. You must 
be in the game. Now, maybe you're like me, and over the past couple of days, days, you've been wondering, you've been thinking, all right, this is wrong. Things must change, but I don't know what to do. I don't know the first step in how to be a minister of reconciliation. Just the other day, uh, Steph received a text message from one of her friends who owns a business, and she was asking Steph for some advice, for some wisdom. Do you think we should respond? How do we respond? How do we respond in a way that helps bring some healing to this situation, in a way that lets others know that we aren't going to stand for the injustice that we've seen, that we've all witnessed together. So there's many of us who are asking, how do we move forward? What are the steps? For so many of us, so many of you, your hearts, they're in the right place. You want to do something, but you're a bit confused like me. Well, what could I possibly do? How could I be an active force of reconciliation? So over the past couple of weeks, uh, th those are the questions that I've been asking. I've been asking as many people as I possibly can, what would you like to see me do? How can I possibly help this situation? As a pastor, as a leader of a church, what can I tell my congregation? What, what can I tell people when they ask, what should I do? So there's three things that I have here. The first, listen. Simply listen. If you're white like me, one of the first things that you can do is listen to our black brothers and sisters. Ask a whole bunch of questions. Or one simple question. How have you experienced racism in your life? You ask that question and you're going to hear a perspective from someone whose experiences living in America have been completely different than your experiences. So it starts by listening and just asking questions. For me, I didn't realize how deep this went until I started asking, hey, tell me what it's like being a black person living in America. I have no experience with that. I, I don't know what it feels like. I don't know what it's like to walk out of my door each day as a black man or woman. So just asking questions and then being humble, approaching the situation with humility, wanting to learn. I think that's a good first step. And then a second way, dialogue. Dialogue, it kind of falls in line with that second step. It's asking questions. It's following up with more questions. Uh, just this past week, last night, I hosted an online Zoom community group, and we had the best dialogue. I can't tell you how full my heart felt at the end of that hour we were all just asking questions of each other. We were talking. Uh, we, were, we were having a conversation, which a conversation, I mean, that, that's, that's a lost art in our culture. We're so busy just texting and staring at screens, although a Zoom conversation, I guess, is still staring at screens, but texting has become the dominant way in which we communicate. What about just putting the phone down and having a conversation, whether it's one-on-one -on -one with a neighbor or someone that we know, someone of a different race than ourselves, or whether it's gathering together like we did last night, like we did Sunday morning for our community group, and just asking questions and listening and brainstorming, getting creative together and asking, okay, I know something must change. We all know things have to be differently. We know as Christians, we have to do something about it, but tell me, what would help? In your opinion, what would help us begin to make the necessary changes? So dialogue, so important during this time. 
And the first question I asked last night was, is the topic of racism an awkward topic of conversation for you? Because for many of us, it is. We were never taught how to have these conversations. And so many of us want to have these conversations, but we don't know where to start. Or we feel like if we were to say this or say that or even ask such a basic question that it would be insensitive or that we would offend someone. So I would say lean into the awkwardness. Lean into it. It's there. Acknowledge it. Even start the conversation. Hey, I'm feeling really awkward about it, but I know this is a conversation that has to take place. I mean, that's how we started our conversation last night. And from there, I mean, we went all over the place. But it, it was healing for me. My prayer is that it was healing for everyone who was on that call last night. There, there's a story in the book of John where Jesus goes and he speaks to a Samaritan woman by a well in the middle of the day which this is wrong on so many different levels. Here's how John describes it in uh, John 4, verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then in parentheses, For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Samaritans were considered half-breeds. They were of a different race. A good Jewish man would not be talking to a Samaritan woman. First, because she's a woman, but second, because she's a Samaritan. She's of a different race. These conversations don't take place. And when Jesus' disciples came up and they saw him talking to this Samaritan woman, they were shocked. This was a scandalous conversation for Jesus. He was willing to lean into the awkwardness, into the uncomfortableness that conversations like that often create within us. So yes, these conversations, they can be messy. They could make you feel a bit uncomfortable. That's all part of it. The only way we'll move forward together is for us to step into the awkwardness. So lean into it. Dialogue. It's where it starts. And then a third way, I think, for us to move forward and to begin to, to make changes and address what's going on. Don't simply let this be a trendy topic. Don't let this be something that we talk about for a week something that we post on our social media page for a day, and then it's forgotten. This has happened way too many times. We hear in the news of an unarmed black man or woman being murdered, and we're all in uproar for a day, a few days, a week, but then that uproar dies down and it's forgotten. We can't let this just be a trendy topic for a week. We have to keep this at the front of our conversations. The only way we'll be able to make a change is if we keep talking about this with our friends, our neighbors, people of different races than ourselves. We need to talk to our kids about this. One of the questions that, that I ask, that I've been asking the parents this past week is, how have you been talking to your children about this? I spoke to some parents and they have children who are nine years old, eight years old, and they don't understand what's going on. They're asking, why? Why did this have to happen? They don't get it. I mean, it breaks my heart to hear of nine-year-olds who have to hear about what is happening, the hatred, the 
injustice that we are all witnessing. I meant to, to have a conversation to explain to a nine-year-old what happened. Talk about a loss of innocence. But we have to talk to our children about it. The only way change will happen is for us to educate the younger generations and let them know, yeah, this goes on in this country we live in. But as a family, we are taking a stand against it. As a family, we desire to raise you in a different way so that this does not continue. So don't just let this be another trendy topic that we talk about, we post about for a week, and then it's forgotten. Then we're on to posting our pictures of what we ate for dinner last night. But rather, engage in dialogue next week and the week after. Let's keep talking about it. Let's keep saying this isn't right. And we need to start treating every person with dignity. We need to start realizing, as we've been talking about at Awaken, we are all human. And our skin color does not make anyone less human than anyone else. We all have the same dreams, desires, and wants for our lives. We are all human. We should all be united together in our humanity. We do not need more division. We need more people willing to stand up, say this isn't right, and to have conversations about how we can make lasting change in our country. So for me, I'm willing to stand up and say the racism in America has gone on for too long. I'm willing to, to take a stand against what's happening in our country and say this isn't right, this can't continue. I'm willing to have the awkward conversations. I'm willing to humble myself to learn from my black brothers and sisters about their experiences of living in America their experiences of racism. I'm willing to lead Awaken into reconciliation. I'm willing to lead our people to being active participants in making a change. I'm willing to take a stand to say this isn't right and together, only together, Will we make lasting change in our country? Are you?